amen, and amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Well, here's the question this morning. Are you hearing from heaven? Well, we know some folks are, because they've been up here talking about what heaven's been talking to them about. Amen. Amen. But we want everyone to hear from heaven. Amen. You know, I won't be satisfied until everyone, including myself, is walking with Jesus, Amen. living like Jesus, being like Jesus. Because really, success in ministry isn't determined by how many people are in a meeting or how much money is in a checking account. Success in ministry is how many are walking like Jesus. Because you can have a crowd, but do you have the cloud, the presence of God in your life? Amen? I mean, the world's doing better at getting crowds than the church is. But they do it for the glory of man. And we're doing it for the glory of God. Amen. And that's a huge difference. Amen. You know, Hebrews 12, and as we get into this this morning, this message, I've just been hung in a few scriptures for the last few weeks. And uh, Hebrews 12, 25, in my Bible, <clears throat> in the uh, New King James, they give chapter headings typically that kind of encapsulates or gives a subject for that chapter. And in Hebrews 12, 25, in the New King James Version, it says, hear the heavenly voice. And it begins in verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. It isn't that God isn't speaking, but we got to listen. Amen. We got to receive his word, digest his word, but then it really doesn't even count at that point. It only counts if we obey his word. Because you can hear his commands. You can even say, well, I received that command. But if we don't change our life to obedience to that command, then it profits us nothing. All it is is useless information at that point. Amen. Amen. So he said, if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth... Speaking of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the prophets, what we call the law and the prophets, which was that covenant of that time, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? He's speaking from heaven to us. And you don't need to, you know, the beautiful thing is, you don't need me to hear from heaven. Amen. I don't need you to hear from heaven. He's speaking directly to our hearts. Now, he gives us information through one another, and he does that for a purpose because we're a body, and we've got to stay connected one to another, so he works through one another. But he is an individual God who's speaking individually to every single heart in this place. And he's saying, don't miss my voice. Don't miss my voice. Because he said, I'm about to shake some things. You ever been through a shaking? Yeah. Have you ever been through a shaking? Yeah. Man. I mean, there'll be days you think you're just doing great, and the next day you're shaking to the core. Everything is fluid except God. He's final. <laughs> You know, life's like water. One day steam, the next day liquid, the next day ice. But God never changes. Hebrews 13, 8. For I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I never change. He said his voice then shook the earth, but now he's also promised saying, Once more will I shake not only earth, but also heaven Man, I mean, this next shaking is going to be worse than any shaking that's ever happened in history. It's going to be worse than the flood of Noah. 
it's going to be worse than the plagues of Egypt. This next shaking, he says, I'm going to shake not only the earth, but I'm going to shake the heavens. I think he's going to get all them aliens too. <laughs> he's going to shake them all up. He's going to get them all. Amen. The whole heavenly host. We call them aliens. He calls them the heavenly host. He's been creating before time began. Pretty interesting. And in verse 20, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In this series, we've been talking about how wisdom comes We've been talking about the fear of the Lord. Why? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Amen. Amen. And so wisdom is such a powerful thing. Another verse I've been stuck in for the last couple weeks is in Luke 5. We've talked about it a couple times where Peter was asked if Jesus could borrow his boat. He launches out a little ways, preaches, and he says, now that we're out in the water, let down your nets for a catch. And Peter said, Master, we've toiled all night. And any fisherman on the Galilee knows you don't fish in the daytime, you fish at night. But yet it's in the daytime. But Peter does something that we all have to do. It was a time I had to do it. And really, I have to do it daily, and you have to do it. He says, nevertheless, at your word. You say let down the net. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I'll let down the net. Amen. Nevertheless, at your word. You know, a lot of people ask me, they say, I just don't know if I'm in the will of God. And one of my first questions, and if you've ever counseled me about this, you've probably had me say this to you personally. Have you told God no? Have you told God no? No, I haven't. Has God told you to do something? You said no. Well, then assume you're in his will. But a lot of times we put being in the will of God in some bliss state. How do you know you're in the will of God? Well, I don't have any problems. I'm filthy rich and everyone loves me. That would probably be more like it would be with the devil. Because he's the God of this world. But when you're sitting there saying, it seems like everyone hates me. <laughs> now, that ain't because you act like a jerk. Amen. I'm saying you're behaving in a godly manner and everyone hates you. It seems like everything's coming against you. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, hell doesn't persecute its own. It comes after heavens, the ones who belong to Jesus. That's who the devil comes after. He leaves his own alone. He's already got them. He doesn't waste good demons on them. Yeah. Think about that. So that was really good. And after they'd done this, now this is what caught my attention. Like I said, I've been stuck in this chapter. This is what caught my attention this week. So when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. That's pretty cool. Talk about paying good rent on your boat. They caught so many fish, their nets were breaking. And they came and filled both boats because they called to their partners, come get some of these fish. We got more than we can even carry to where both boats began to sink. And when Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And they were astonished at the catch of fish they'd taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. Now, verse 11 is what got me this week. Verse 11 got me. So when they brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. 
They just received the catch of a lifetime. Probably it never happened in their careers as professional fishermen. And all that Jesus gave them, those loads of fish, probably could have paid off their boats, paid off their accounts, paid off their debitors. They could have paid off everyone. It says they forsook it all and followed him. You know what we see happen a lot of times in the kingdom is when God does keep his promise, which he said, I will bless you. And it was prophesied here this morning. They forsake God and keep all he gave them. Because once you see him, nothing else compares. (laughs) Once you've seen him, you can't be bought. I hate to say this, you can't be tempted. Now, and and by that, I don't mean you won't have temptation. I'm saying once you have seen him, once you have had that connection and heaven has touched your heart, your heart has touched heaven and Christ has become real to you, you are ruined for any other. You know, we had a, a family come up and visit during our conference and from Florida and uh, the next week, he sent me a text. He said, I'm suing you. I said, you're suing me? And he said, yes, I'm suing Dave Chisholm. I said, why? He said, because your church has made going to church anywhere else obsolete. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm glad he felt that way. Not everyone feels that way, else we wouldn't have empty seats this morning, you know. But he felt that way. Why? Because he, he received a touch from heaven, and he had a connection with Jesus during that conference, and it's not just church anymore. And then he's texting me the next week. He said, we're just figuring out how we can get back there more often for church. Why? Once you've had that, heaven to earth connection once that voice has fully revealed itself inside you I can say you can't be bought and to a degree you can be tempted but you won't follow the temptation you won't why you know it's just like there was only a few of those disciples that really made the connection with him in his earthly life. And how do you know that, Dave? Because the day he offended them all, he looked at the 12. He offended the whole crowd to the point they all left. He said, you want to leave too? I believe it was Peter that said, where do we go? We're ruined for any other. We're ruined for any other. Once you've had his glory. You know, that's why the scripture even talks about that place we call apostate, to commit apostasy. You know, he says, once you've tasted the heavenly gift and been a partaker of the things which are to come, if that one falls away, it will be impossible to renew him to repentance seeing he would crucify the Son of God openly for a second time. But there is a taste like no other. You know, I've I've been riding in cars my whole life now. Riding in cars my whole life. From my dad's 53 Chevy with the three-speed on the column that I learned to drive when I was nine and they left the house and you didn't need a key for it. I'm out cruising the neighborhood, nine years old, and dad's 53 Chevy. Amen. And uh, I've driven a lot of cars, nice cars, junk cars. I mean, I've been in the cars you prayed to get there. 
And I've been in the car. But, you know, one day at Bible college, we were sitting right before class started, and there was windows to the parking lot in our, the room we were in. And all of a sudden, somebody said, hey, come here and look at this. And we looked over, and there was a Rolls Royce Silver Spur rolling into the parking lot. And this big old guy got out of it. And uh, he come in. He was just a big old teddy bear. His name was Steve. And we're like, is that a, he's like, yeah. He owned a mortgage company called Colonial Life in Fort Worth, Texas. And we got to know Steve pretty well. And so one night after class, we were doing night classes. And one night after class, Steve said, what are you guys doing? We said, oh, we're just hanging out. He goes, come on, let's go for a ride. And he put us in that Rolls Royce Silver Spur. Son, we were styling and profiling. (laughs) And I'll never forget, I sat in that car. And I can tell you I was ruined for any other. I ain't never experienced luxury and comfort like was in that car. You know what's funny is we mortgaged, uh, when we bought our new house there last year, we did one of those mortgages that they sell your mortgage. And you know who bought my mortgage? Steve. I get the thing, Colonial Mortgage, Fort Worth, Texas. I said, isn't it a small world? Hey, man, you now own my mortgage anyway. But long story short to that is, once you rode in one of those, you, every other car just doesn't have the comparison. Of course, every other car doesn't cost $350,000, right? or whatever they cost now. Once you've tasted of his goodness, you're just ruined for any other. Amen? You're just ruined for any other. So that caught me this week. After he gave them everything they wanted, everything they wanted couldn't compare to what they wanted now. Him. Have you tasted him? Have you tasted him? like that have you tasted him like that then you can't be bought you can't be bought there is nothing else there's nothing else nothing else matters I love that amen let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 now 1 Corinthians chapter 2 I was going to preach another thing and during praise and worship I I just felt heavily directed to minister this chapter so I went back in my notes real quick and amended them 1 Corinthians chapter 2 I'm going to be reading this from the Amplified Bible as for myself brethren when I came to you I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony and evidence or mystery or secret of God concerning what he had done through Christ for salvation of men in lofty words of eloquence or human philosophy or and wisdom human philosophy and wisdom you know a lot of churches would never let what happened here this morning happen. Why? Because when we get in front of a crowd, we only allow you to see the most polished we have. That's human pride. But we have kind of an open mic policy here that very few churches have, and that is, if you know the culture of this church, if you believe you get a word from the Lord and you want to share it with the church, we give opportunity for that to happen. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 14 gives us the order of worship services for the church, and it tells us if any of you has a psalm, if any of you has a word of prophecy, let everyone have an opportunity, but let it be done decently and in order. Now, we do qualify people to the extent of we say this. If you ever come up and take the mic and you say, thus saith the Lord, and you give a bad word or, in other words, something that isn't right, then we have to correct 
correct it publicly. Why? You gave it publicly. Now, if you make a mistake privately, you get a private correction. But if you make a mistake publicly, if you come up here and say, the Lord says this, and it's not, then we have to correct that. You know, my son-in-law, Jeremy, who's pastor in Vertical Life Church, the church they planted in Raleigh, he still tells the story. I just heard him tell it again. Why he came to this church, you know, everybody thought it was for my daughter. (laughs) He didn't know her when he first came, but he came to the first Sunday service, and he grew up in church. And the first Sunday he was here, and he says somebody got up and gave a goofy word. And I stopped him, and I corrected it. He said, that blew my mind. I'd never seen that in church before. Because they did something wrong, and I said, that's not God. Now, we'll try again next week. We just corrected it. And he goes, that's why I came back to your church. Because I'd never seen that kind of decency and an order in correcting things. Because we want it to be biblical. We want it to be accurate. We want it to be doctrinally pure as we know how to make it when we present things to you. Amen? Amen. So we don't come here to baffle you or to wow with eloquence or human philosophy and wisdom. I consider myself a pretty um, average I guess you'd say speaker, but I do have one edge. It's the anointing. It's the power of God in me and on me. That's the only advantage I have. I'm not the most, I'm not what some would call a wordsmith or the most eloquent, lofty speaker you'll ever hear. I tell people jokingly, I am world famous in about two city blocks. And maybe one zip code, you know. Because he said, I resolved to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing, and to be conscious of nothing except Jesus Christ the Messiah and him crucified. That's all I got. What do you got, Chisholm? Jesus. What do you got? The Holy Ghost. What do you got? Father God. Presenting Jesus, all he's ever done, all he is doing, and all he will ever do. That's it. That's it. For some, that's not good enough. They're still living in human nature. But like I say, once you've tasted once you've tasted. I'll never forget, I, you know, I grew up in a little church with my mother taking us to church every Sunday. And I'll never forget uh, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I was in Texas. My mom's in Ohio. And I called my mom. And I'm like, Mom, I got saved. David, that's wonderful. Mom, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Silence. Mom, I'm speaking in other tongues. I'll never forget her words as long as I live. These were her words. Oh, my God, David, I knew something like this would happen to you. (laughs) She really did think I had gotten in some crazy religious cult. And I said, Mom, it's in the Bible. David, those things aren't, they passed away. And I said, no, mom, they didn't. They're here right now, and I got it. Well, needless, just make a real long story a lot shorter. A year later, I knelt with her in her living room in front of her couch, and she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues, and she became one of the most powerful prayer warriors with a prophetic anointing of anybody I've ever seen. To this day, man, she is, whoo, she is a Holy Ghost terror to the devil. Amen. Powerful, powerful.
powerful woman of God. When I look back at those days and I think how far, how many experiences since those days. Jesus, wow. For everyone younger in this room, all I can say is get ready. Man, do you got a lifetime in front of you. You got a lifetime of signs, wonders, and miracles. One day you'll be sitting there looking at your grandchildren, telling them the great things God has done for you. Keep telling what he's doing today. And keep telling of what he did yesterday. And keep prophesying about what he's going to do tomorrow. You know, when Gary Nangle came to me a couple years ago and said, Pastor, I believe, I believe I'm supposed to lead a prayer group for these Sunday morning services. 8.50. It's got to be 8.50. Why? Because Gary said it, 8.50. He said, I believe we're to pray for this nation. Pastor, our nation's in a mess. And he started that group. And then he came back a couple years later. He started talking about Pastor Dave. We had 38 up there. Then there's 40. Then there's 42. And then he told me, he said, I'm going for 50. I said, Gary, you get 50 up there and I'll jump off this stage and run around this sanctuary. Well, this morning. Well, this morning. I just had to wake up sore this morning. Well, this morning. He come up, I had 51. I thought you was a man of prayer. If I break something, you can heal it, right? He said I had 51. My God, 51! My God, 51! My God, 51! 51! Hey! Bam! 51! 51! Hey! 51! 51! 51! 51! 51! 51! Well, you kept your end of the deal. Guess I better keep mine. You know how they have them pitch hitters in baseball? I need one right now. (laughs) Hallelujah. And Greg come in this morning. Friday night, said, He called an impromptu prayer meeting, nine to midnight, that 70 people show up on a Friday night. Well, I'll run when you get 100. (laughs) One lap at a time, brother. (laughs) Haven't been doing my cardio lately. Amen. Wow. Wow. So I've resolved to know nothing but Jesus. Verse three, and I was passed into a state of weakness and fear, dread and great trembling after I'd come among you. See, Paul fought it too, man. He said, man, I had a tough day. He had tough days. He had tough days. It's not easy. It's not easy. Carrying his cross every day. My language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, and plausible words of wisdom like you'd think, 
but they were in a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. A proof by the Spirit and power of God operating on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers the most holy emotions and thus persuading them. You know, I've I've said this for years, the difference between a dead church and a live church is emotion. And I've said this for years, you can have the emotion without God, but you won't have God without emotion. In fact, God, he, he takes your emotions and flips them out. He takes your emotions and turns them upside down. A hardened criminal will become a baby prayer warrior, just cries all the time. Amen. Amen. Someone that is a stoic and is, once they get wrecked by love, they're completely different. He takes our weaknesses and then he puts his strength in them and baffles the world. You know, this morning I, we, we heard of another tragic situation where a man took his life this weekend. And, in, and, and I asked uh, Pastor Greg, I said, what is the suicide rate in Wood County? And he said, oh, it's, it's horrible right now. It's horrible. Colton's nodding his head. Why? He's an officer. I mean, it's every week, isn't it? What would you guess, because just working in the system, what would you guess right now? Couple of weeks, I don't know. Two or three suicides a month in a county the size of Wood County. Two or three suicides a month. Man, life can deal you some pain and suffering. I mean, you've got to be hurting bad to take the out of death as the cure of your pain. You know, for years in theology, it was taught all people who commit suicide go to hell. I can't teach that because I don't know. The Bible really doesn't say that. It really doesn't say that. So I'm not going to add to the word or take away from the word. I'm just going to say, I hope somewhere in the mercy and grace of God, somehow they found a way. I don't know. My, 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 my mercy isn't as big as God's. I know that. He forgives when I have a tough time forgiving. He forgives easily. Amen, because he's God. And he knows the heart. And we're gonna, everything's going to be judged after the heart anyway. But that's how painful life can be right now. And we need a big old God who can wreck those emotions that people are having, that emotion that's driving them to literally take their own life, to be able to drive them to keep their life with everything within them. Because God wants to do more through you. He's not done with you yet. He's not done with any of us yet. Stirring in the hearts of my hearers. You know, I I can't stand up and tell you a lot of textbook things. I can, but it's kind of a waste of time. All I can tell you is I was blind and now I see. I was deaf and now I hear. I was lost and now I'm found. I was an eternal criminal, and now I'm in the assembly of the saints. That's really my testimony. You've heard my testimony. I didn't have anything to offer him, but he had everything to offer me. And by becoming a great receiver, (laughs) you know how you become great in his kingdom? By becoming the biggest receiver in the crowd. By allowing him to be bigger in you, you must become smaller. So that he can be enlarged, you must be diminished. You've got to lose your identity in this world and take on the identity of heaven. And man, I love that ministry and that anointing that gets into your emotions and persuades you. It gets into your emotions. 
As a young believer, I remember hearing stories from then, the guys that are my age now, the old guys. Amen, the OGs, the old guys. I just learned that's what they call us now. He's an NOG, a nice old guy. The old guys, I remember them telling the stories of how they'd had a lifetime of the faithfulness of God. And I remember sitting there, you know, 22, 23 year old, sitting on the front row, taking notes, saying, if he did it for him, he'll do it for me. Because he's no respecter of persons, because there's no big and little with him, it's faithful or unfaithful. I mean, what other kingdom? will actually promote you for just believing what you don't have. He made it so easy for everybody to come in, didn't he? Just believe and act like it's true. Just believe and act like it's true. Just believe what he said. He'll do what he said he'll do. Hmm. He said, I don't want your faith to rest, in verse 5, on the wisdom of men, human philosophy, but in the power of God. You know, I can't sit up here and write a textbook on 18 steps that set me free from 12 years of addiction. I can't do that. All I can tell you is I got on my knees in my living room floor and I lifted up my voice and said, if you want me, you better do something because I'm going down and I can't stop sinning. I love to sin. Can't say because I entered into this state of discipline and learning and and I, I, I discovered this. No, I cried out. (laughs) <laughs> What's it say in Psalms? This poor man cried and the Lord delivered him. I told you last week, you got to lift up your voice for wisdom. You got to cry out for understanding. And I pray after that challenge last week, I'll be laying on hands on a bunch more of you this morning. You got to believe wisdom is a spirit. Amen. It's an impartation. Not the wisdom of men, but the power of God. Yet when we're among the full-grown, spiritually mature Christians who are ripe in understanding, we do impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden, but it is indeed not wisdom of this present age or of this world, nor the leaders and rulers of this age who are being brought to nothing and are doomed to pass away. That's why I only get so involved with this world's government systems. I vote, I make platforms known, but I am not losing my sleep over none of them. They can't save me. No party can save me. No election can save me. Oh, you may save me a few bucks, but money comes and goes like the wind. The wisdom of God says, you better watch that money. That stuff will just take up its wings in the middle of your life and fly away after you've given yourself holy just to get it. I mean, I stand here and preach this every day and then watch people walk out the door following the God of money every year. It's like a revolving door. God gave you a boatload of fish and now forget God, you're after the fish. He didn't give you a boatload of fish so that you'd serve the fish. He gave you a boatload of fish so you'd known he who can give a boatload of fish and serve him. That's why he gave him a boatload of fish. I wanna be one of those Peters. You know, every time in my life when I reach a place of what I'll call contentment as a young man, he said, okay, now uh, it's time to uh, unpack again. Forsake all and follow me. I did that 10 years ago. I know. 
It's a new decade. Forsake all and follow me again. Oh, here we go. Cash out, flying in the wind. Where do we land next? Only the Lord knows. And then one day I realized something. And, and I know that I know now. <laughs> it's so funny. I'll never forget one day my pastor called me. There was a guy when I was young that was probably the most famous speaker in the full gospel charismatic circles on planet Earth. His name was Kenneth Hagin. And I grew up chewing on his doctrine and words. And he fed my spirit for so many years. And he's in heaven now. But I'll never forget one day my pastor, who was one of his best friends, called me up. And he said, Dave, I was just up at Ramah with Brother Hagin. And he said, we were riding around in this big old car. And he said, Brother Hagin was showing me all the things that God had blessed him with. This new building and this new ministry and this new building. And he said, you know, Dave, Brother Hagin turned around to me. And he said, you know, Bob... He said, I don't want none of this stuff. I just want Jesus. But the more I fall in love with Jesus, the more this stuff I end up with. <laughs> that was probably 30 years ago. I'll never forget that conversation. Amen. I just fell in love with Jesus. But the more I love him, he don't mind, you know, that prophecy that came forth this morning. Wow. Wow. That was one of the first prophecies I ever got, almost word for word. Jenny, almost word for word. I was walking through my kitchen in Fort Worth, Texas. I'd been praying because they had had a building capital campaign to try to pay off the, the million dollar debt back in 1983, 84. That was a lot of money back then. Million ain't that much anymore, but it used to be a lot. And we were trying to raise money to pay it off. And I was praying one afternoon in my house. And I said, I was walking across my kitchen. I said, Lord, if you just give me a million dollars, I'll just go pay it off. And I was reaching for the handle of my Harvest Gold refrigerator. Rust, kind of a rust gray nylon carpet on the floor. I remember it like it was yesterday. I'm reaching for the handle and I have a vision. And I see Jesus in the heavens, and he's bent over, and his arms are full of gifts. And he looks at me, and he says, son, I want to give you these more than you want to receive them, but I can't hurt you. Amen. And the vision was over, and I went, oh, man, I'm not ready yet. He just told me, you couldn't handle the blessing. It would make you walk away from me. Amen. I mean, the treasure of this earth has turned many a man from God Amen. and is still today turning a many heart from God, the treasures of this earth. Wow. So we're setting forth Verse 7, a wisdom from God once hidden from human understanding and now revealed to us by God. That wisdom which God devised and decreed before the ages for our glorification to lift us into the glory of his presence. None of the rulers of this age or world perceived and recognized nor understood this. If they had, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. But on the contrary, as the scripture says, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and has not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared makes and keeps ready for those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying him and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. Yet to us, God has unveiled and revealed them by and through his spirit. For the Holy Spirit searches diligently, exploring and examining everything, even sounding the profound and bottomless things of God, the divine counsels, and the things hidden and beyond man's scrutiny. What person perceives and knows and understands what passes through a man's thoughts except the man's own spirit? Within him. 
just so no one discerns, comes to know, and comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God given to us that we might realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts of divine favor and blessing so freely and lavishly bestowed on us by God. And we set these truths forth in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truths with spiritual language to those who possess the Holy Spirit. Dave, why are you guys so big on trying to get people filled with the Holy Spirit? That's why. Amen. That's why. And why are so many churches not even pressing the matter? That's why. Because if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in a ditch. Whew. There's a glimmer in an eye once you've seen him. <laughs> There's a sound in a praise once you know him. That's what says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, do you fear the Lord? I fear missing him. I fear grieving him. I fear drifting away from him. I fear hardening my heart to him. I fear an offense or a root of bitterness springing up separate me from him. I fear my faith being wounded by a disappointment because I set my heart on earthly things. Amen. That's the fear of the Lord. Amen. I'm not thinking he's up there getting ready to zap me with a bolt of lightning. The fear of the Lord I have is that I would miss him. Yeah. That I would stray from his word or his precept. That I would... Be misdirected in following him. That's the fear of the Lord we're talking about here, guys. And wisdom tells us. You like that? Yeah. I don't like it too much. Amen. Wisdom knows how to look at a blessing and say, I have the blessing. The blessing doesn't have me. Wisdom knows how to look at a disappointment and say, apparently he knows better than I do that that was not for me. Yeah. Wisdom knows how to look at relational difficulties and say, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. Yeah. And forgive me, Father, for I've hurt others too. Yeah. Wisdom keeps us on the narrow path that leads to life and helps us to continually to see the multitude that is heading headfirst, headlong over the cliff of darkness. Wisdom helps us not to think we're too wise in our own eyes, but to trust in him for all things. Wisdom tells us you're not smart enough to give your own opinion, so please answer by the word of God. That's what the wisdom I'm talking about does for you. Man, I spent most, a lot of time yesterday reading through several Proverbs, and I was like, I want to preach this one. No, I want to preach this one. No, I want to preach this one. I had three picked out, and then I'm in Corinthians. <laughs> you know, I go through the book of Proverbs, and I just look, and I say, Look, it tells me what to do. <laughs> I read the Bible and it just tells me how to live. I was talking with someone and they said, you know, I, I came to your church nine years ago and, not the, and, and I love when they said this. They're up teaching children's church now. It was Jerry and Nan. 
And they said, you know, it wasn't that there was anything wrong. It wasn't that the church we were in was bad. They were teaching us good things. They said, when we came here, you taught us how to live those things. And I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I want to know that everything I'm preaching is practical to the point of I can walk out these doors and do the message. Because if it's not practical, it's not going to help you spiritually. If you can't walk out of here and love and live this life, that's why, you know, I end up preaching. I was telling, I think it was, who was I talking to the other day? I was talking to someone the other day, and I said, if you ever follow me very long, you'll find out that 80% of my ministry is the epistles. And an epistle is not an apostle's wife. That's an old Bible college joke. Guy was talking about, okay, I need you to study the epistles. And guy lifted up his hand. He said, is an epistle an apostle's wife? And the whole church started laughing. And he said, no, son, an epistle is not an apostle's wife. And so he lifted up his hand again. He goes, well, then whose wife is she? (laughs) He just wasn't getting it. The epistles are the writings of Paul. Amen. When we go from Romans all the way through Revelation, it's the writings after Christ died. And those writings teach us how to practically in daily life live this gospel that we learned. It teaches life application of so many things, especially in the life of the community, of the body of believers, the body of Christ, the church. So he goes on to say in verse 14, the natural non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Holy Spirit of God. They're folly, meaningless, nonsense to him. And he's incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding, becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritually discerned, estimated, and appreciated. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into questions and discerns all things, yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. I'm telling you, your life don't make a lot of sense to the outsider when you live fully for God. It really doesn't. And you know what I'm talking about because you have friends that say, how long does your church last? What do you mean? I had someone come to me the other day and they said, yeah, I was telling a friend about church service. They said, what do you mean you got out at two o'clock? What time did you start? They said, 10. They said, how could anyone be in church for four hours? It doesn't make sense. You don't make sense to this city. You really don't. And you're not supposed to. But once you've seen him, (laughs) you're ruined for the buffet. (laughs) You're ruined for the buffet. You're ruined for any other. The roast will be burnt, honey. Let her burn. (laughs) They're imparting wisdom this morning. Let her burn. I'm going to finish this up with Proverbs 2. Just a few verses here because, again, Alex shared this. This one, he came at me and he said, Pastor Dave, can I share this? And he had Proverbs 2.2. 2. And I said, well, you might as well. It's already in my notes this morning. You might as well go ahead and pre-preach it. Amen. Proverbs 2.1. My child, will you treasure wisdom? Then, and only then, will you acquire it. That's the only way. You got to treasure it. Well, what's that mean? Well, what does it mean when you treasure something? It means it gets your best. It has your protection. 
It has your care. It has your attention. When you treasure something, it has you. And only if you accept my advice and hide it within you will you succeed. Well, I'm doing pretty good. Why do you say that? Well, I've got money in the bank. I'm pretty healthy. And how long do you think you can hold on to that? Amen. Ain't never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. You ain't taking nothing with you. Job said it best. Naked I came in. Naked I'm going out. I was upset in the army one day because I didn't have any money. And there's a guy running around with in Kansas, in Fort Riley, Kansas. His name was Cool Breeze. <laughs> Yeah, he was black. <laughs> He's one of my best friends. Cool breeze. He come up to he said, David, what's what's up? I said, Cool man, things are He looked at me, he said, David, David, let me tell you something. Let me tell you a few things my daddy told me. And I said, What's that, cool? He said, When you were born, you were a bill. And when you die, you're gonna be a bill. And in between, there's gonna be bills. So don't worry about it. I said, cool breeze, you got it, baby. You got it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So train your heart to listen when I speak and open your spirit wide to expand your discernment. Then pass it on to your sons and daughters. You know, my grandson was mowing my yard last night, and I was listening. I was sitting on the front porch studying for this message, had my computer, and I'm listening to the lawnmower up on the other side, and I'm hearing the lawnmower, and I knew by the sound where he was, he was along the ditch on the side of my driveway, and all of a sudden, I heard the lawnmower stop, and I went, oh, he's in the ditch. And then I heard that wonderful sound of trying to get a lawnmower out of the ditch. <laughs> and I knew what he was doing. I could picture it. It was like watching a movie in my head. He turned off the blades, and he was trying to rock it back and forth, trying to rock it back and forth. And I thought, I'll just let him work at it a while. He needs to learn something. You don't get too close to a ditch. Because ditches have a way of sucking you in. And so I waited about 10 minutes and the mower would start and it'd shut off. <laughs> it'd start and it'd shut off. So I went and got the side by side and threw a strap in the back and started up the driveway and I come around the driveway and he was over there breaking off a big limb of a tree and he was going to get him something to look right that thing up over there. He had his earbuds in. He didn't see me or hear me. He's walking back with that big old stick and all of a sudden he went, <laughs> And I said, yeah, I knew you were stuck. He said, how'd you know? <laughs> I said, you really are only 14, aren't you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I thought to myself, man, I said, okay, Lucas, lesson life. Don't get too close to the edge or you'll get sucked in. If he can learn that lesson with a lawnmower, he'll learn it with a woman. He'll learn it with a girlfriend. He'll learn it by not doing, you know what I mean? Don't get too close. You'll get sucked in. You stay away from those boundaries. You stay right in the middle, man, right with God. Don't get over here on the edge. Well, I think this is okay. No, if you don't know, just stay away from it. Just stay away from it. See, wisdom is always crying out to us. Now, I pray that, Lucas, did you learn that yesterday? Yeah. You won't get too close to the edge anymore, will you? No. Wisdom come in an unusual way yesterday. But I pray that everything in his life for the rest of his life, he, he remembers that day. You get too close to an edge, and you, you, you can fall in. Sins that way, always sin that way. Well, I can watch this. Oh, I can drink this. 
Oh, I could smoke this. Oh, we can go a little further. No, you just stay right in the middle of the road because there's no danger there. He goes on to say, if you cry out, verse 3, for comprehension. If you cry out for understanding, comprehension. So it makes sense. So it makes sense. If you lift up your voice, if you cry out for understanding. I mean, our part of our prayer time every day would be saying, Lord, I'm so dumb. Please help me understand life. Amen. That should be part of our prayer. You shouldn't be going in to give God instruction. You know, like the old saying goes, there's a lot of Christians who want to serve God, but only on an advisory capacity. I'm here to tell you, God, a few things. You don't know. Man, just come into him. Wisdom, I need you. I try every day to pray. Most powerful prayers, I think, other than the Lord's Prayer in the Bible or Paul's prayers in Ephesians. This calls, man, for this calls. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant unto me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Oh God, I pray my eyes would have understanding that I'd be able to see what you see and know what you know. Teach me the divine yeses and the divine noes and let me echo them in my own heart. Teach me your ways. Lord, I'm but a child. I'm but a child in learning. I'm but a child in understanding. I humble myself before you and I ask you to help me make godly decisions. I mean, there's a good chance you're going to face things this coming week that you really don't know the answer to. Good chance. Maybe it's something simple. Maybe it's something difficult. Should I buy this car now? Do you know wisdom standing there to tell you, no. Why not? I want it. Because you can't make the payment. Oh. Oh. Because there's something coming. Because that's a lemon. I was there when they made it. That's the Holy Spirit. I was there when they made it. I can tell you the transmission's going to die a week after you get it. I remember one day I, I, was, I was working car lots trying to pay bills when I was younger. And I, I ran a route and I, I, I fixed windshield chips on uh, car windshields. And I did car lots all through. I did Parkersburg. I did uh, Huntington, Charleston. did car lots all over the place. And and one day I was thinking about a car and I'll never forget, I walked, I was on this one little car lot down on the river in Huntington and, and I've dealt with a guy every week and he had this really nice Nissan Maxima. And uh, I, I pulled up there and I'm fixing rock chips and I look over and I saw that Maxima. And I'll never forget, I went, man, I like that. And I was needing a car. And so I walked up to the manager, I said, hey man, what's, it, what's, what's the story on that Maxima? He said, that's a clean ride. I said, yeah, it is, isn't it? He said, it's a nice car. And I just started praying. And I said, Lord, is that my car? Is that the one you have for me? I just thank you for it right now. I just thank you, Lord. If that's a car, I could afford it. It was in my budget. And I just had this inside, just not now, not that car. No explanation. I didn't have a mechanics report. I didn't have, they didn't have Carfax back then. Didn't have auto eye packet. Didn't have any of that stuff. All I knew was it was a nice looking shiny Maxima. And I came back the next week. And that manager walked up to me. He said, hey, Dave. I said, yeah. He goes, you know that Maxima you're, look, you're looking at? I said, yeah. And he goes, good thing you didn't buy it. I said, why? He said, there was another company across the street. He said, the guy over there bought it, drove it like 
100 miles, and I, th- I don't remember if it was a computer or something went out of it. It was like a $3,000 repair. And it was probably only a seven or $8,000 car. When you buy a car for seven or 8000 you've got to pay 3000 to fix it. That's a hurt right there. And I just went, thank you, Jesus. woo Oh, he wants, to, he wants to deliver you from the sour lemons of life. Come on up, guys. He wants to deliver you from the sour lemons of life. Amen. I mean, what will you need wisdom for this week? What will you need wisdom for this week? I've got offered a new job. Should I take it? Should I take it? Well, how do you like the job now? I like it. Was it secure? Yeah, well, what about that new job? Is it secure? Well, it's a little bit of a risk. But I'll make another four bucks an hour. Well, is the risk with four bucks an hour worth the security of what you have now? What's wisdom saying? Do you know every time I violated the law of wisdom, when I'm, what I'm talking about right now, every time I go against that little thing in my gut, it costs me money. And I don't like, I've only got a few testimonies of, I should have listened, because I usually listen, but guess what? Sometimes my soul still wins out. And I don't follow that little, that little unction, that little feeling, that thing inside me that's saying, don't do it, or that thing inside me that's saying, do it. I don't follow it. And then guess what happens? Later I'm saying, oh man, I should have listened. I should have listened. I should have listened to that little voice inside me that was trying to lead and guide me, trying to help me be blessed and have a good life. I love all these experiences I've had that lead up to this moment in my life. And I'm just sitting here saying today, God, I don't want to miss it one more time. I don't ever want to miss it again. I don't ever want to miss your voice again. You called me. You're leading me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. You're trying to walk with me throughout my life. Wisdom. I cry out for you today. I cry out for you today. Wisdom, I cry out for you today. We're going to sing this song, and I want you to read the words as we sing it, and then we're going to pray. Hallelujah. This is a good song about wisdom. Real good song about wisdom. Yeah. 
follow my friends To love me at my worst And even when I don't remember You remind me of my worst I don't trust my ways I'm trading in my thoughts I lay down And even when it don't make sense I'm gonna let the spirit lead yeah. I'm gonna let the spirit lead I'm gonna let the spirit lead yeah. I'm gonna let the spirit lead. Well, last week. I told you, wisdom is a spirit. Wisdom is a spirit. It's one of the seven spirits of God. It's one of the manifestations of His presence, and it comes by impartation. Now, we've already read how it comes. It comes by seeking it. It doesn't come by taking an IQ test. It doesn't come by taking a any kind of test, it comes by crying out for it. And last week, I'd given you a challenge. Will you lift up your voice for wisdom every day? And those who said they had, I prayed for them, for an impartation. I have the spirit of wisdom. It's on me. It's in my life. It comes from seeking it for all these years. And last week I laid hands on the people and all I'm praying for is the impartation. God transfers anointing by the laying on of hands. That's what the scripture teaches. It's amazing that churches don't do it. I don't understand that. I mean, he says in the word, Paul even told Timothy that he received his giftings by laying on of hands of the presbytery. By laying on of hands. He said, that's how you got your gifts, son. Don't neglect them now. It's all through the scriptures. But most churches never preach it. They never do it. I don't understand why, but that's between them and God. But I know in this house, I believe on the power of laying on of hands. And I believe in the impartations of the Holy Ghost. And maybe I'm just that simple. But it's the simple things like that that God uses. We already read about the wisdom of the world. It doesn't work with God. So if you're here this morning, you say, this week, Dave, I did lift up my voice daily for understanding. Now, if you came up last week, you don't have to come up again. Why? It's an impartation. You got it. If you reached it, if you received it, you got it. Now begin to walk in it. But you're here today, and I told you last week, do it this week, and I'll lay hands on you this week. I'll pray for anyone this week who says, I lifted up my voice. I did what you said. I was a doer of the word and I prayed for understanding and I prayed for wisdom and I spoke it out because that's the one's wisdom's going to land on this morning. Those who seek her as treasure. If that's you, I'm going to have you come up. I'm just going to quickly lay hands on you and pray for you. It's going to be a, a quick move, an impartation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For other folks, if you're done, God bless you. You have a great week, and we thank you so much for coming out this week. Amen. And I encourage you this week, you lift up your voice for understanding. You cry out for wisdom because wisdom is ready to impart. Wisdom is ready to impart. Father, I do pray now that you answer the prayers of your people. I do pray for an impartation of wisdom. I pray, Lord, for an impartation of wisdom. I pray for an impartation of wisdom. I pray, Lord, for an impartation of wisdom, Father. I pray. 
for that impartation of wisdom. I pray, Lord, wisdom, come. Wisdom, come. Wisdom, come. Thank you, Lord, for wisdom. Wisdom, 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 Lord, your spirit, your spirit, Father, your spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, spirit of wisdom. Spirit of wisdom, Lord, I just pray for that impartation. Take of the spirit of wisdom that you've put in me, Lord, and impart it to all those who are seeking. Holy Spirit, fill their hearts with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Fill their hearts with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Fill their hearts, Lord with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Lord, you said, how will a young man cleanse his way? How will a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your words. Father, I pray that the impartations, impartations, wisdom will know what to do. 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 It'll know. It'll know what to do. Wisdom. Wisdom. Lord, eyes that see clearly. Ears that hear with sensitivity. Hearts that understand and comprehend. Hearts that hear. If you say to trust, I will. Hearts that hear. Teach me how to Hearts that hear. Thank you, Father. Impartations of wisdom. 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 Come, wisdom. Land upon these who seek. Come, wisdom. Land upon these who seek. Come wisdom, land upon these who seek. Come wisdom, land upon these who seek. Fill their hearts to overflowing. Lord, let them see with your eyes. Let them hear with your ears. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that everyone will receive Receive from the wisdom of the throne room. Receive from the wisdom of the throne room. They will be filled. Filled to overflowing. Filled to capacity and more. Lord, let them be so full of wisdom that it exudes out of them. That they will truly know. They will truly know what they ought to do in every life application, Father. There will be a knowing, a divine 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 discernment and knowing, discernment and knowing, discernment and knowing, discernment and knowing, Father. Wisdom, 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 wisdom. Wisdom, Lord. More and more and more and more and more and more and more. More. More wisdom than ever before. Lord, let there be such an increase of understanding. Such an increase of understanding. Such an increase of understanding. More and more and more wisdom. More and more and more and more and more wisdom. Thank you, Father, for it. Wisdom and discernment and understanding. 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 Thank you, Lord, for it right now. Thank you, Father. 
just receive it receive it just receive it just receive it just receive it hallelujah just receive it that spirit of wisdom that spirit of discernment that spirit of understanding hallelujah hallelujah spirit of wisdom thank you father for it just receive it right now jesus name jesus name spirit of wisdom spirit of wisdom spirit of wisdom spirit of wisdom more 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 wisdom more wisdom more wisdom more wisdom more wisdom more understanding more wisdom more understanding more wisdom more understanding more wisdom more understanding lord give them more 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 wisdom god more understanding more discernment than ever before father more wisdom more understanding more discernment than ever before lord we thank you for these impartations today we thank you father for these impartations we thank you father for impartation wisdom lord wisdom 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 comes wisdom comes wisdom comes oh let that spirit just begin to take up room inside of every person that seeks her let that spirit take up residence let it fill every room of every house let it fill every room of every house jesus lord i pray for wise counsel wise counsel wise counsel wise counsel wise counsel wise counsel father wise counsel wise counsel father wise counsel the spirit of wisdom and wise counsel spirit of wisdom and wise counsel the spirit of wisdom and wise counsel thank you for it father thank you for it lord spirit of wisdom wise counsel Jesus name thank you Lord spirit of wisdom and wise counsel to rest rest on your people that they may know what they ought to do that they may know what they ought to do Hallelujah. I want to encourage you all to begin again. Read the book of Proverbs. Read it in every translation you can find. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Just begin to pour through these books and let these impartations take deep root inside of you. And you'll know what you ought to do. Amen. You'll know what you ought to do. Have a great week in the Lord. Thank you so much for coming today. Amen.